Okay, in terms of stuff, deadlines, well, slight change, uh, but only beneficial. Uh, exams one through four, uh, deadline on April 26th. If you haven't done exams one, two, or two, uh, I didn't, you know, reset your exam if you already done it, but if you haven't done it, it's available once more. And deadline's on April 26th. Uh, Quiz and Science Part 4, available on April 26th as well. Also, um, if you missed out on some quizzes, uh, look into the folders and I opened some quizzes in Part 3 and some assignments in Part 3 as well. And so, uh, if you haven't done any stuff, look in there. If it's doable, you can do it. For exam 5, the excited final, deadline's Wednesday of finals week uh, at 5 p.m. And the way the final works, and then you got several emails about this. Uh, the way it works, as I said before, is that once you've done all the stuff you wish to do, all the four standard exams, all the quizzes and assignments, etc., look at your overall grade. If it's less than an A, then the final might be able to help you. Maybe not. If your grade is already an A, you've got a maximum A and you can't get more A than A. So the final would do nothing. If you have less than an A, then uh, get the grade estimator. Put in a hypothetical 100% for exam five. Put in your best three exams. Then put in your overall, thank you, overall quiz grade, overall assignment grade, and then see if there's a letter grade or more difference. If there is, the final could help you. If there's not, the final would do nothing. There's no like miracle of the maths where it would suddenly do more than it can do. And so the grade estimator would give you, you know, the, assuming you put in more numbers, give you the right result. Not taking the final can't hurt you because anything you haven't done is treated as a zero. So as you do stuff, worst case scenario, your grade stays the same because nothing improves. And of course, the better case scenario is your grade goes up as you do stuff. And if it goes down, uh, then something terrible is happening. So contact EIT, let them know that he needs a blackboard or doing that. So those are the dead ones. And again, you can do all the stuff um, ahead of time. Just be sure to complete it before the finals. And again, the uh, quizzes are worth 30%, assignments 30%, exams 40%, best four to five exams, best 10 assignments out of 27, uh, best 10 quizzes out of 16. And again, Blackboard doesn't hide or delete things, so if you go in there, you'll still see your grades. I often get lots of emails from people saying, my grades are still there, or, you know, what's it doing? And it doesn't delete them or mark them or hide them. It just does the calculation. So if you go and check the math, you'll see that it's right. And if it's not right, again, contact EIT and tell them something terrible is going on in that system. Okay, before heading on to our new stuff, anything about the stuff to be or the stuff that's been that needs more stuff? So last time we began our adventures in truth, functional logic. And we saw that the essential idea of it, what makes it truth functional is the truth of the whole depends on the truth of the parts. So if you know the truth value of the parts and how they're connected together, you know the truth of the whole thing. Now, you might say, doesn't everything work like that? Doesn't the truth of the whole thing depend on the truth of the parts? And there are some interesting exceptions to this. Uh, one standard one, for example, is what's called intentionality. Not in the, not in the sense of doing it intentionally like I meant to do that, but it's a philosophical phrase for aboutness, being about something. And a good example of this is belief. Belief is an intentional state because it's about stuff, because you've got beliefs about stuff. So, for example, the claim um, unicorns exist and horses exist, that would be a true functional claim. So the truth of the whole thing depends on the truth of the parts, and obviously that would be a false claim because although there are horses, there are no unicorns. But if someone believes that, believes that there are unicorns and horses, the unicorns are just like fancy horses, then the truth of that claim doesn't depend on the truth of these parts. It's true if they believe it. So there are some contexts where the truth of the whole thing, Sally believes there are horses and unicorns, doesn't depend on the parts. It just depends on her believing it. Now, fortunately, we don't have to worry about that. But if you take um, other philosophy classes, etc., um, you'll see that you know, not all things will be true functional. But from a practical standpoint, 
we can just ignore this because we're just dealing with the true functional stuff. So the truth of the whole depends on the truth of the parts. So parts is parts, and the truth of the whole thing depends on those parts. Now, as I mentioned, we're learning a new language. And it begins with English, or whatever language we might happen to be using, but it ends with symbols. And so a properly formed sentence in this language consists of only the following stuff. First, claim variables. So they stand for things, but we won't use any actual you know, English words or phrases. We'll just use claim variables, and they're like the variables in math, in that they stand for stuff. Or metaphor metaphorically speaking, you think of them as boxes or bags or tokens, which stand for, for other stuff where you put stuff in there. Also, we'll have the connectives, and those link them together. And lastly, we'll have the parentheses, open and close parentheses. And so a, a sentence in this language consists of only these parts. And it's a correct sentence if they're put together properly. So when we get down to the sort of the final stage, no English words at all, just these symbols. Now, one critical assumption of true functional logic is that any claim you make is either true or false, but never both. And as I mentioned, there are more advanced logics that allow you know, a range of values as opposed to just binary logic, you know, either being true or false. Now, we can do a lot with true or false. As I mentioned previously, your laptop, your phone, your, your PlayStation, or Xbox, or Switch, they're all running true functional logic. Everything is done with zeros and ones, which correspond to uh, zero for false, one for true. Now, I mentioned before the truth tables. So a good question is, what are they? What are they for? What do they do? How do you build them, etc. Well, ultimately, the truth table is our test for validity in true functional logic, at least in this, what we'll, what we'll do. And our ultimate goal is to get a normal English in a symbolic form, get it into a truth table, and then look upon it to see whether the argument is valid or invalid. Now, before we get there, though, we've got to do, in a way, truth tables that don't really do anything except show us how stuff works. So ultimately, we're going to get to the truth table test for validity, but for now, we're just getting to the, the setup. And kind of like with the going back to categorical logic, we looked at the two circle things, and they actually didn't do stuff except to show us how to work the circles. And then we got, of course, to the three circle diagram, and then we did the actual test. Kind of the same with these truth tables. We'll look at the setup for the truth table, test for validity, and then the stuff we'll use to get there, we won't actually use that, that stuff except as a setup for the truth table test. So, for example, we'll never use this or this again by itself because, as we'll see, aside from showing how it works, it doesn't do, do really anything. So, metaphorically speaking, a truth table is a map. It is a map of possible worlds of worlds that could be, that might actually be, but perhaps are not. And given the assumption that any claim is either true or false, but not both, the truth table shows us what could occur. Again, a map of possible worlds. So if we have one variable, or you know, moving away from the fancy metaphor, what a truth table does is show us the possible combinations of true and false, given the assumption that any claim is either true or false, but not both. So less metaphorical, less poetically, it just shows the possible combinations of trues and false. Now our most simple table, which we shall never use again, is a single variable. And this is effectively does nothing except show how the tables work, and this is how it maps up. If you have any variable, it's going to be either true or false. So for example, this illustration, you have P, and it's either going to be true or false. Those are the two possible states. Now, 
You may wonder, what good is that? What can you do with just true or false? Well, not a whole bunch, but you can do more than nothing. For example, the light switch, the standard light switch, is actually this truth table. Because a standard light switch is either on or off. Also, the power button for your phone, your computer, laying aside you know, functions like sleep and hibernate, etc., is a is this. Your, your computer is either on or off. Again, laying aside like sleep and hibernate and that type of stuff. And so it's actually a pretty useful circuit. You know, light switches, uh, on off switches for all manner of equipment and appliances. Now, we can start building on these tables to, well, the first build is adding a second variable. And again, this table in a way is not really doing anything except showing us, you know, how these get filled in. Now, when you're building a table, as I mentioned, they are a map, poetically speaking, of possible worlds, the way things could be, and perhaps are. Less metaphorically, again, it just shows us the possible combinations, what could occur. Now, the way we map this out will be standard. So any time you're doing a table with just two variables, the table will always look like this. And the reason why is very straightforward. What you have to do is show all the possible combinations, what could occur, and here are the possibilities. If you have two variables, whatever they might be, and to use a uh, illustration, imagine um, a really lame combination lock that only has um, you know, two little wheels, and there's only two settings for the wheels, you know, the true and a false. So if you're spinning those wheels, what combinations could you have? Or another illustration would be if you ever um, you know, seen light switches that are often in hallways where you have a switch on either end, and it would be you know, flipping, the, flipping the switches, you know, one on, one off, et cetera. So what combinations could you have? Well, going with a metaphor of the super lame combination lock, it would be both could be true. One could be true, one could be false. The first could be false, the second true, and they could both be false. And those are the all, all the possible combinations. And if you go through, you can say, yeah, that's either they're both true, they're both false, or the first one's false, or the second one's false. So this shows all that can be. Again, given the assumption that any variable is true or false, but not both. So how do you know how to build that? Well, one way to do is just simply memorize it. Two variable tables always look like that. Now, what about why they look like that? What is the sort of formula behind it? Well, conveniently, interestingly enough, it's pretty straightforward. Any table you build, you'll need to know the number of rows. And the rows, of course, are going this way and the number of columns. And of course, columns, just like in buildings, they're the ones going straight up and down. Now, as we'll see in the future, deciding on the number of columns can be kind of tricky. Now, here it's pretty easy. It's just, OK, we got P and Q, so two columns. Now, for the number of rows, we have a handy, super useful formula. The number of rows is always 2 to the n, where n equals the number of variables. Why is this the case? Well, here's why. There are two possibilities, true, false. And so each variable has you know, two possible settings, on, off, true, false. And so this gives you all the possible combinations you can have. So if you have two variables, two to the second, so four. So you need four rows. If you have three, it goes to eight. And then, of course, it keeps growing pretty <laughs> pretty large-scale uh, inflation. So it goes 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 512, 1024. If you've ever uh, done stuff in computers, you might have noted that like things like RAM and hard drive size, etc., it goes in those same amounts. And as you might imagine, it corresponds to the true functional you know, logical stuff. Now, so if you're building a table, 
you always know the number of rows. Once you find out the number of variables, two, three, four, ten thousand, it's always going to be two to the n. So it'll always be you know, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one twenty, eight, five, twelve, one thousand twenty-four, uh, two thousand forty-eight, etc. Now, as you might imagine, as a practical matter, only people who are like, I guess, super crazy into logic would build really, really big tables because it would just become, you know, crazy how much space it takes up. But in theory, you can have massive, massive tables. So once you know how many rows you got, how do you know how to fill them in? Well, here's how it's done. You always start off furthest to your right, the variables. Now, when building a table, the variables live to the far left of the table as a matter of convention. Could you put them elsewhere? Um, well, technically, yeah, as long as you did the stuff right. But just like with traffic laws, even though we kind of make this stuff up, it's a good idea to follow them because otherwise bad things could happen. So if someone says, I don't believe in red lights, all lights to me are effectively green, that's not going to work terribly well. Likewise, a person could kind of do whatever they want, but generally not going to work super well. So what we do is you always start off furthest to the right-hand side, and we alternate singles, TF, TF, until we run out of rows. And again, we know the number of rows because it's always going to be two to the end. So if you have two variables, it'll be four, three variables, eight, etc. Now, could you, like, throw on some more rows just for fun? Well, you could, but then that obviously would create problems because it would be you know, kind of wrong. Then what you do the next step is you head to the left, then you alternate pairs. So it would be TT, FF. Now, if you are done, if you don't have any more columns left, you're obviously done because no more space to put stuff. And so once you've got you know, all your rows filled in, all your columns filled in the variables, you're done. So the rows are the easiest thing to do. The number of rows is always two to the n, it has a number of variables, so it's going to be you know, 4, 8, uh, 16, 32, etc. And you had to be right, alternating singles, then you alternate doubles, and then when you see bigger tables, you go to groups of 4, uh, then 8, then 16. So this far left row will always be half and half. The far right will always be singles, far left always half and half. And it always goes that way. So any table with P and Q always looks like this. Now could you like flip them around, etc.? Um, yeah, if you're consistent, you could do all kinds of stuff. You know, flip you could have false, false, true, true, um, you know, false, true, false, true. And that would all work as long as you're consistent. But again, just like with the traffic laws, Unless everyone knows what you're doing and they're aware of what you're doing, it can end badly. So if you take, you know, a logic class and just do the tables, whatever, they could be technically right, but typically someone's not going to spend the time to check every single table to make sure someone's not a free spirit striking out on their own. Because it can be hard to tell the difference between a free spirit striking out on their own and someone who doesn't know what the, the heck they're doing. So just like with the traffic laws, it's always good to stick with the conventions to avoid needless collisions. So that's table building basics. Now, as I mentioned before, these tables really don't do much for us. I mean, yeah, I can model a light switch or an off switch. And this model, as you know, is the possible combinations of P and Q. So what we're going to do, of course, is move beyond this. And these are mainly, again, just for a setup, to show the very basics of the basics. Before moving on to more truth table stuff, anything about how this works. It needs more stuff. Okay. Now, if all we could say is P, P, Q, uh, that would be pretty limited. You'd be like only able to use like single, single words. Now, just like in natural languages like English, logic has connectives that allow us to make more complex sentences, like, you know, not rain opposed to just rain, or raining and snowing, or raining or snowing, or if it rains, then it will snow. So I need these connectives. Now, we have, at least in this textbook, 
We call them the connectives of negation, conjunction, disjunction, and what's called the material conditional. If you take a uh, logic class, you may see what's called a material uh, conditional, which is the double arrow thing, which we'll see how to do that, but it's the author's word of reason decided not to include it, but you may see it in the future if you take a logic class. So when we're building sentences, we got claim variables, connectives, premises. Now what we have to do is see how the connectives work. Now, we know how they work in normal English. In fact, um, centuries ago when I was a kid, I remember Saturday morning cartoons, they would have the schoolhouse rock with conjunct, conjunction, what's your function? And I assume since there's very little budget for educational stuff, that they still show anything educational on TV, it's probably the same thing. It's the same series that brought us the uh, explanation of, you know, the I'm just a bill thing. I think that's slow around too because again, this is why I spent money on teaching people stuff. So, if you happen to see that educational cartoon short, you already know all the stuff. Because you know, essentially it says, you know, conjunction, conjunction, what's your function, and it explains all of that, you know, with badly drawn cartoons, or not so bad. So our first connective is called negation. Now you may look at it and say, wait, <laughs> Negation is applying just to one thing. How is that a connective? It's not connecting it to anything. And so in a way, negation is kind of the sad connective because it's all, in a way, alone, disattached to one thing. But we don't want to embarrass negation, so we won't you know, bring too much attention to that. So yeah, it's a connective, but it's only being stuck on one thing. So how does this work? Well, negation in logic works exactly like negation in normal English. In normal English, if we have a claim and we negate it, its truth value reverses. So if a claim is true and you negate it, it becomes false. If a claim is false and you negate it in normal English, it becomes true. So for example, right now it's sunny. If someone says it's not sunny, they're wrong, that's false. It's not raining right now, so the claim it's raining is false. So if someone says um, it's raining, that would be false. If they say it's not raining, that would be true. So negation just reverses a polarity. And fortunately, this one, again, works just like normal English. It works exactly the same way. So nothing fancy there. The symbol for this is, well, if you want to be fancy, the tilde. Or squiggle, or whatever you want to call it. Or, of course, you can just use the old standby of the minus sign. Either one's, you know, fine. So, this is what the truth table for negation would look like. And again, we typically wouldn't do much of this because it just gives us the claim the negation, but it shows us how it works. Now, for each of these connectives, we'll get a illustrative table. And the illustrative table is something that shows us how it would work. But it's, think of it as an example. It's not it's not the only way that this can ever be presented, because as we'll see, you can, you can negate like more complicated things. But to use an analogy, it's like if you're um, you know, taking a class on web design, and it might say, in your um, web page, you can embed graphics in a table to organize them. And they might have an example of like a picture of a cat embedded in a table beside a picture of a, I don't know, a squirrel. And of course, you don't, that doesn't mean that you always have to, can only have pictures of cats and squirrels. It's just illustrating. This is how you can use you know, this web you know, uh, HTML feature. Likewise, this shows us how it works, but it, this is not the only thing we can do with it. Just like if you're getting learning like, how to set web pages, you don't always have to use only what they show you. It's just an example. So what is the definition of negation? Well, it works like this. If you have a claim and you negate it, you just reverse that column. So the variable or whatever is being negated, the negation column becomes the opposite. True becomes false, false becomes true. So this shows us with the shortest possible illustration how negation works. Now again, we're not just limited to negating single variables and not just limited to negating P. We can negate you know, really complicated things that we'll see in the future. 
But basically this illustrates and says, hi there, I'm negation. Look at what I'm negating, look at that column, and just reverse it. So if it's true in the column of the original, it becomes false in the column of negation. If it's false in the column of the original, it becomes true in the column of negation, and if it's true in the column of negation, oh, sorry, true in the column of the original, it becomes false. So true becomes false, false becomes true. And that's how negation works. And again, we all know how this works already, because it works just like with English. If you say not, you're denying. So if it's true, you say not true, false. Or it's false, you say not false, true. So that's our first and simplest connected. Before moving on, anything about negation that needs more stuff. Okay, now to a slightly more complicated connective. And a connective that actually connects. This one is known as conjunction. And the things that are being joined are called conjuncts because they're being conjuncted. Now, conjunction works like and in normal English. And when we use and in English, if we're using it you know, properly, in order for the whole thing to be true, all the parts have got to be true. So more formally, a conjunction is true only if both of its conjuncts are true. Otherwise, it's false. Now, we already know this, because that's how AM works in English. So, if um, you're throwing a party and you need like hot dogs and buns, and someone says, I'll take care of that, if they show up with hot dogs and buns, they've told the truth, they fulfill their obligation. And they show up with just hot dogs with no buns, I guess better than nothing, but they have failed you. Likewise, if they show up with buns with no hot dogs, they failed you. If they show up with nothing, they double failed you. And so it works just like normal English. If you have promised two things, the person has spoken truly if they deliver those two things. If they deliver one or the other or nothing, they have spoken falsely. They have failed you. Now, the symbol for this is, not surprisingly, the ampersand. Some logic books use the uh, dot, which is just the dot. Some use uh, an upside down V. And so you may see, depending on you know, what logic book you look at, you may see other symbols. There is no international interplanetary symbol of, you know, uh, Bureau of Logic symbols. And so different books use different, different symbols. Most uh, use the ampersand because, well, going way back, it was something that was on typewriters, and typewriters generally didn't have like the big dot or, or the sort of carrot-like symbol. Now, in normal English, we have a lot of phrases that do work like and, although they can have different um, sort of implications to them, like the word but, while, even though, even though you'd use them differently than and in terms of like making point. So if you use the word but, you're usually kind of saying this, and of course here is something, something else that you're bringing in that is still a conjunction, but again our implications are somewhat different than when you use the word but. And all the normal stuff we have in English that means and, you know, would work the same way. So the truth table for it would look like this. Now since we're conjuncting stuff, we got to have two things to conjunct. Conjunction never works on its own. So you wouldn't have P and or just and Q. You have to have two things being conjuncted. As always, the table for the variables, uh, the, table, the section of the table for the variables looks the same. So you start off figuring out the number of rows through to the end. So in this case, four. And then as always, you go furthest to the right for the variables and you alternate singles, TF, TF, and then you head to the left, alternating doubles, TT, FF, and then of course we're out of, we're out of you know, columns. So we're done there. Then of course we're gonna fill in this column. Now the definition of this symbol tells us how to do the conjunction. And what a conjunction says is this. It says, hi there, I'm a conjunction. Look to my left, look to my right, if there's truth standing on both sides of me, I'm true. If not, I'm false. 
just like normal and in English. So if they're both true, the whole thing is true. So if someone says, I shall bring hot dogs and rolls to your party, and they show up with both, they've spoken the truth to you. If they show up with just hot dogs but no buns, they've spoken falsely. If they show up with no hot dogs um, and just buns, they've spoken falsely. They show up with nothing, they've spoken falsely. Again, just like normal and in English. The whole thing is true if both parts are true, otherwise false. Now, this table again is just an illustration. It's the simplest possible conjunction, namely just two variables being you know, conjunctive. But as we'll see in the future, you can have more complicated scenarios. You can have something like Something like that. And it would still be, as we'll see in the future, still a conjunction. Because one handy thing about true functional logic is, even if you have like these weird, you know, huge complicated sentences, at any given moment, there's only one main connected. So this is still, a, even though it's got all this other stuff going on in the parentheses, as we'll see more of in the future, the parentheses are like, think of them like shipping containers or like a bag. So whatever is in the parentheses is treated just as one thing. So the way you can think of this is just A and B. Because even though there's all kinds of stuff going on in there, it's all contained in parentheses. So think of parentheses as like bags, shipping containers, boxes, whatever metaphor you like. So you can treat them as just a single thing. Just like if you're going to the uh, 10 items or less checkout you know, lane, and you've got a box of cereal, they don't obviously count all the flakes in the box, they just count the box. Or if you have a bag of oranges, they don't count up you know, all the oranges, it's just a bag of oranges, even though there's stuff inside there. So I think the parentheses is like box, um, box, boxes or bags or shipping containers, whatever metaphor you like or hate. So that's our friend the conjunction, symbolized by the ampersand. Again, other logic books use the dot or the you know, upside down, I guess, the wedge thingy. Uh, but again, the symbol is not critical unless you just need to know, like, what is the symbol symbolizing. Before moving on to disjunction, you think about conjunction that needs more con or junction. Disjunction. Disjunction, well, this becomes potentially more complicated, but fortunately not really. Now, there are actually two types of or in English. There's what's called the inclusive or, and there's the exclusive or. Now, the or of logic, unless otherwise specified, is the inclusive or. So what's the difference? Well, the exclusive or, is this, one or the other, but not both. The inclusive or is one or the other or both. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is that would be how the truth table works. To use a normal real life example, weather is a inclusive or. So suppose in the winter, uh, the weather person says, we'll have rain or snow. If it rains, they're right. If it snows, they're right. And if it rains and snows, they're also right. Because with weather, it's one or the other or both. The exclusive or is the or of sports and sides at a restaurant. So in sports, if you have the Red Sox or Yankees, one has to win or the other wins, but they both can't win. Except, you know, metaphorically in a life lesson sort of way. Similar with like uh, sides at a restaurant. If you get like a uh, hamburger, any of your choice of say uh, fries or onion rings, it's an exclusive or. You, you can get both if you want to pay for both. The idea is you get one or the other, but not both. So you get fries or onion rings, but not both. Now the or of logic is the inclusive or. So unless it says otherwise, and pretty much no one ever says otherwise, it's always this inclusive or, one or the other, or both. 
So, a disjunction in this case is true, where one's true, the other is true, or both. The only time it's false is if both parts are false. For example, suppose we go back to the hypothetical party and one of your friends is in charge of bringing the dessert. And they say, I'll stop by Publix and I'll get a cake or pie. Now what they promised you is cake or pie. So when would they be lying? When would they fail you in their deserty duties? Well, if they show up with cake and pie, they've spoken the truth. They have cake, they get pie, great. If they show up with cake, but sadly no pie, they still told the truth because they said they were bringing cake or pie. They didn't promise both, just one or the other. If they show up with no cake, but have pie, well, no cake, but they still told the truth. The only way they have failed you and are lying is if they show up with nothing. No cake, no pot, just a lie. And so it does correspond to our normal intuitions about that type of order. Namely, again, you're playing a party and someone promises cake or pie. Uh, if they bring one or the other, they, they come through. If they show up with nothing, they have lied about the pie. So recap, disjunction symbolized by the V. Uh, I don't think there are any other symbols that people use for it. Although you could obviously just make up whatever you want um, if you're making your own logic book. It is true when either or both are true, otherwise false. And again, this table here just shows how it works. We're not limited just to P or Q. We can do, again, very complicated, you know, conjunctions of all kinds of stuff going on both sides. Okay, so we looked at negation, which is either of negation. When what I'm negating is true, I'm false. When I'm negating is false, I'm true. We looked at conjunction, which says either of conjunction. When what I'm conjoining are both true, I'm true. If not, I'm false. And of course, disjunction, which is one is true, or the other is true, or both are true, I'm true. If both are false, I'm false. And last, but definitely not least, will be what's called the material conditional. Before we go into that, though, anything about the stuff so far that needs more stuff? Deconditional. Now, this symbol, the material, what's called the material conditional, was actually created, even though it, you know, corresponds kind of to the English, you know, language if then. Now. One thing that's different about the conditional claim, one critical thing about it is, it's not um, symmetrical. In other words, you just can't like flip things around and have them mean the same thing. Now, to illustrate, if we go back to conjunction, you may wonder, well, what if we have Q and P? What would that look like? And logically, that changes nothing. So. Q and P would be true, false, false, true. Still work the same way. Now obviously, if we're talking about the order of things, the order does matter in a practical sense. So for example, if uh, one is putting on you know, uh, boots and the other is walking across broken glass, uh, in real life the order matters. You want to put on the boots before walking across the broken glass, most definitely. But logically, there's no difference between those two. You know, Sally put on her boots and walked across a broken glass is logically the same as Sally walked across a broken glass and put on her boots. But obviously, from a practical standpoint, temporal order doesn't matter. But logically, you know, it doesn't. Practically, of course, it does. So logically, there's no difference between P and Q and Q and P. Likewise for disjunction. There's no difference between P or Q and... and Q or P. So Sam brought pie or Sam brought cake. Again, the order doesn't doesn't matter. It's Q or you know, Sam brought pies or Sam brought cake. Sam brought cake or Sam brought pie. Doesn't matter. You can flip them around. It makes no difference. Now with the conditional though, the order does matter. Now because of this, the slots for a conditional get their own names. Now with the disjunction and conjunction, 
there's not a, there's not separate names. So with a conjunction, they're just conjuncts because again, their order from the standpoint of logic doesn't matter. Likewise, for the disjunctions, there's no different name for the first one or the second one because they're just disjuncts. You can just flip them around however you want. But with a conditional, order matters. So the first one, <coughs> the thing on the non-pointy part of the arrow is called the antecedent, you know, ante before. Then the thing uh, that's getting pointed by the arrow is called the consequent. So it's if antecedent then consequent. So why do they get these you know, separate names? Well, the reason why I alluded to is that the order matters. So if antecedent then consequent isn't the same as if consequent then antecedent. So you just can't flip them around, have it be the same thing. So how does this work? Well, conditional claims are false if and only if the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. Otherwise, the whole thing is true. Now again, the reason why the order matters is because it's a conditional claim. It's saying, if you get this, then this. And the reverse need not follow. For example, to give a you know, quick illustration, if you get a 70, then you pass this course. Totally true. But if we flip that around, if you pass, then you get a 70, totally not true. Because while it's true that if you get a 70, you do pass, it doesn't follow that if you pass, you get a 70. Because you could pass with anything from a 70 to 100. So although it's true that if you get a 70, then you pass, it's not true that if you passed, then you must have a 70. So you can't flip them around. Now the symbol for this is the arrow. Now in some logic books, they use what's called the horseshoe because it's a symbol in, you know, in set theory. And some people still use this. So if you go to like the Wikipedia or see a different logic book or go on you know, the web, you may see uh, the arrow, you may see the horseshoe. Uh, often older logic books use, use the horseshoe. And then people realize, well, this is kind of confusing because it's already a symbol somewhere else, so let's just go with the, the arrow. So the table for this, and again, the table shows what could happen. It gives an example of how this works. Just like, again, metaphorically speaking, if you're you know, taking a class on web page design and it shows you how to put in a picture, it's saying, yeah, you can put a picture in like this, but it doesn't have to be like this picture of a cat. You could put in any picture. This is just how pictures work. And this shows how the conditional works, how it functions. Now, building the tables, you always need to know number of rows. And again, that's always two to the end. So you got two variables, so you're going to have four rows. Then in this case, we've got a column for the P, column for the Q, column for P, then Q, and then we get to fill in the T's and F's. And as always, you start in the variable column furthest to the right, alternating singles, TF, TF, head to the left, alternating pairs, T, T, F, F, and then we're done. We've filled up both our columns, all our rows, and then we fill in the if P, then Q. Now, when we fill in the P, if P, then Q, is we use the definition. The conditional says, hi there, I'm the material conditional. If my antecedent is true and my consequent is false, then I am false. In all the cases, I am true. Now this might seem initially a little weird. You know, first it starts off you know, making sense, then it seems to get a little weird. So starting off, if the antecedent is true and the consequent is true, yeah, it makes sense the whole thing is true. If true, then true, true. Um, if true, then false, the whole thing's false. Yeah, that, you know, that makes sense. For example, um, suppose you send me an email and say, hey, if I get an A in the final, do I get an A in the class? And I say, yeah, and you get an A in the final, then you get an A in the class, then I spoke the truth. You, if you get an A in the final, you get an A in the class. If you get an A in the final, 
when you look at your you know overall grade, it's just a B. You would probably send an email saying, probably you would probably wouldn't say, hey, why are you lying to me? I mean, you'd probably say, I believe there's some sort of mistake there, which is a fancy way of saying, I think you're lying to me. So if I say to you, if you get any in the final, you get any in the class, and you get that, you know, you get like a 95 in the final, and your grades still be, you would of course say, hey, you didn't tell me the truth. So, so far so good. But here's where it may seem a little weird. If the antecedent is false, and the consequent is true, the whole thing is true. So kind of weird. But wait, it gets weirder. If the antecedent and the consequent are both false, the whole thing is still true. This may seem weird because false and false gives you true. How can that be? Or, you know, is this some sort of weird parallel universe where false becomes true? Or is it like Washington, D.C., where lies are truths, and truth are lies? Well, no. It actually makes sense. And here's how. So we'll go back to that example. Suppose I say, you email me and say, hey, um, what happens if I get an A on the final? And I say, well, if you get an A on the final, 90 or higher, you get an A in the class. And then you go and you get an A on the final, you get an A in the class, you'd be like, great, you told me the truth. And if you get an A on the final, but don't get an A in the class, you would quite correctly send an email saying, hey, where's my A? But now suppose you didn't get an A in the final, but you got an A in the class. Shows up on our Rattler, there's your A. Now you probably wouldn't want, you know, want to like, you know, question that, because A is there, but I haven't lied to you. Because what I said is, if you get an A in the final, then you get an A in the class. I didn't say anything about what happens if you don't get an A in the final. So this could be false, but this could be true, but I haven't, I haven't lied to you. Now suppose, again, I say, if you get an A in the final, you get an A in the class, but suppose you take the final and you get a five out of 100, and you don't get the A. So they're both false. Um, you didn't get the A in the final, didn't get the A in the class. And suppose someone goes to the dean and says, Dr. LaVos here, he told me if I got an A on the final, I get an A in the class, but I didn't get an A in the class. And the dean says, well, what'd you get in the final? And someone says, person says, I got a five. I don't know how much? 100. You're like, yeah, that's, that's not a problem. Because he promised you that if you get an A in the final, you get an A in the class. But of course, I made no promises about what happens if you get a five in the final. So that could be false. No A in the final. No A in the class. But I've not lied. Because I said, what would happen if you did get an A? I didn't say what happened if you didn't. So even though it's kind of weird, it does actually make sense because the conditional is like a promise. Another illustration, imagine um, the professor says that if it's their office hours, they'll always be there, which of course is some promise no one can ever keep because meetings and illnesses and stuff. Now if you go by the person's office, and it's their office hours and they're there, they told the truth. If you go by their office hours and they're never there, they've lied. If you go by their office hours, and, I mean, if you go by and it's not their office hours, but they're there, it'd be weird to say, to tell, say, you're lying. Well, no, because this doesn't prove that they're lying. Because what they're saying is, if it's their office hours, they'll be there, but it doesn't mean they can't be there when it's not their office hours. It's not like we're banned from our offices outside of our office hours. And if you go by and it's not their office hours, and they're not there, you know, if someone runs to the dean and says, dean, dean, if the professor's not in their office, the dean says, uh, were they supposed to be there? Well, no, it's not their office hours. They weren't there. And the dean would be like, oh, well, that's, that's to be expected. People don't have to be there when it's not their office hours. So even though both are false, it's not their office hours and they're not there, their promise is still true. It hasn't shown that they've been lying. So the way the conditional makes sense is, again, think of it as a promise. When has a promise been shown to be broken? And the answer is, when you fulfill the condition of the promise and it's not delivered on. But if you don't fill the condition, but you still get what was promised to you, lucky day. If you don't fulfill the promise and you don't get what you know, you're supposed to get, well, they haven't been shown to be, be a liar. And so it actually does make sense. So one way to deal with the conditional is, think of it again like in terms of the promise. Another way to deal, which doesn't require any real thinking about it, is just memorize how it works. A conditional is false, 
when the antecedent is true and the consequent is false, otherwise it's true. And this is the most complicated of the, of the connectives because the order matters. So if Q then P is not the same as P and Q, and it's got, you know, initially sort of a counterintuitive, uh, you know, way of working. But when you think about it, it actually makes, makes sense. Before pressing on, anything about the conditional, the most challenging of the connectives, if it needs any more stuff. Okay. So at this point, what should you know? Well, claim variables, connectives, we haven't got the parentheses yet, but so we still need to know the, their thing, and how these connectives work. And again, the example table show like examples of how they work, just like to use the analogy of like a class of web design. If they show a picture of a web page with a picture of a cat on it, they're saying you could put a picture here in this manner, but of course you don't always have to use a picture of a cat. Likewise, these tables show you how they work, but not everything involving a conditional is going to look exactly like this table. You can have very different things, but the conditional always works the same way. And the definition of each connected is this. Negation reverses the truth value. You take the columns being negated, just reverse it. Reverse it. True becomes false, false becomes true. Conjunction is true when both parts are true. So you look at both the, con both the conjuncts line by line. When they're both true, the whole thing's true. Otherwise, false. With disjunction, you go to the two columns, check them line by line. When one or both of them are true, it's true. If they're both false, it's false. And with a conditional, you go down the table, line, you know, row by row, line by line. And if the antecedent is true, the consequence is false. It's false, otherwise true. And so those are the functions, hence truth function. So before pressing on, anything about that stuff it needs more stuff. OK, logic, much like math, which is the form of logic, is very um, buildy in the sense that in order to like get the stuff that comes up later, you gotta have the you know foundational stuff first. Otherwise, it just makes less and less sense. So before pressing on anything at this point that doesn't make sense, I mean not not, not in the whole world because a lot of stuff in the world doesn't make any sense at all. But in this in this stuff. Now, as I mentioned, the connectives are not just limited to their example. Tables. So, you, for, for example, you can have um, not P then Q instead of just the, the sort of illustration of P then Q. Now, as long as you know what the connectives do and you go step by step carefully, you can always do the tables. Now, where people go wrong usually in logic, basically there's two ways. One is, just like the rest of life, not knowing what one's doing. So, if you don't know how the connectives work, it's not going to go well. The second thing is you can know what you're doing, but when you're working with like complicated tables, it's easy to like put something in the wrong place or just kind of get lost or just kind of get bored of the, the grind of logic. And those are kind of the ways to go, go wrong. And so in doing it, just like with anything that involves a lot of complicated steps, the thing to do is go just step by step. And obviously enough, if you do each step correct, then the end result will be correct. So as an example, suppose we, we want to know what would be the column for not P then Q. Well, here's how we build it. As always, we need to know our number of rows, and it's always 2 to the n, so 4. Then for our columns, each variable gets its own column. And then every part gets its own column. And we'll see more of this in the future. So not P gets its own column, so we know what the value of that is. And not P then Q gets its own column. Now it might be tempting just to go with, you know, what we saw before and just treat this as P then Q. But of course it's not the same thing. Because if P then Q is obviously different from if not P then Q. So here's how we do it. Filling in the columns of the variables is the easiest. If you have two variables and nothing weird is going on, which it shouldn't be, you always go to the terrible, uh, column for the variable, for this to your right, 
alternating singles, so TF, TF. Then you head to the left, alternating doubles, true, true, false, false. And then with the two variable table, done. Not P, well, we saw this um, back in the recent past. And negation says, hi there, I'm negation. Where I'm negating, just reverse. So in this case, we've got a four row table, so we can't obviously go, you know, false, true. So we go to the P column and we apply <coughs> negation. So true becomes false, true becomes false, false becomes true, false becomes true. Then we get to the not P, then Q. And again, it might be tempting to just do the if P then Q, but obviously if P then Q is very different from not P then Q. For example, saying if you get an A on the final, then you get an A in the class is very different from saying if you don't get an A on the final, then you get an A in the class. So this would be, the kind of the implication would be is you need to do that final if you want to get an A, and this one would be saying, would seem to you know, basically imply, well, if you don't get A in the final, you get A in the class, which would seem to be implying that you don't need to take the final because no matter what you do, you'd get, a, you know, you'd get the, the A. And so they're saying different, different things. So how do you do the table for this? Well, the easiest way to do it, again, as I mentioned before, is the variation on Nike slogan, which is not fire or stuff, but just do it. In this case, don't think, just do it. And so the thing to do is just know how the connective works and just grind through it. So a conditional says, hi there, I'm a conditional. Look at my antecedent, whatever it is. Look at my consequent, whatever it is. And if my antecedent is true and my consequent is false, I'm false. Otherwise, I'm true. So in the normal table, you know, kind of our standard example, P then Q, that's where I see and there's a consequent. So true, true is true. True, false is false. False, true is true, and false, false is true. But here it's changed up. It's not if P then Q, it's if not P then Q. So we can't look here to here because we'd be doing it wrong. We have to look, here's our antecedent, here's our consequent. So it'd be, this is our antecedent column, our consequent column. So we look here to here. So if false then true, true. If false, and false, true. If true, then true, true. If true, then false, false. And so as long as we know what the function of, this, of the connective is, it's always a matter of just going row by row and looking at two columns. So it always comes down to, except for um, uh, negation. Negation is you look at one column and just reverse its polarity. With all the other connectives, though, you're always looking at two columns with disjunction and conjunction, the order doesn't matter. So if it was Q or not P or Q and not P, you would never have to worry about the order. You just go down the columns. But with the conditional, order matters. You just, you just can't go Q then P because the results would be wrong. So antecedent consequence. So we look this way. But as long as you know what this does, this says, again, hi there. Look at the um, antecedent. If it's true, look at my consequent. If that's false, I'm false. Otherwise, I'm true. So false and true is true. False and false is true. True and true is true. And true and false is false. And done. So as long as you know the function of the connective, again, it's just a matter of going down, except for the case of negation, going down two columns and doing the thing, looking at you know, the truth, that, the truth value for each row or column, and then putting the tier up in the, that particular row for that column, and just grind down through all the columns, putting in T's and F's, and done. So on the plus side, there's always a definite process. There's, there's no art to this. It's just a very definitive, you know, look at one column or look at two columns, and then apply the thing. You can just do that. So you're always just looking at, at a single moment, two columns, you know, except for negation, and you're applying the, the function. And then just put that in the, the third column. And just go all the way down to your outer rows. Now on the minus side, as you might imagine, 
this is, for most normal humans, this is not particularly interesting or, or exciting. So what usually ends up doing people in is just like, oh, so many rows and columns, and T's and F's, and your brain just kind of shuts off trying to protect itself. So being able to endure the tedious is a critical skill in this. Or some people, uh, when I was in grad school, they called them logic hounds. They just love logic. They're super excited about it. And some people do because people are different. And what is deadly boring to one person is incredibly exciting to another. And, you know, vice, vice versa. So basically it's a, a grind that requires careful step-by-step -step approach. Now, interestingly enough, that's actually a pretty good skill to have because a lot of things in life are grinds and step-by-step -step and tedious and can have serious consequences. For example, um, if you're going to be a pilot, you got to go through that checklist. Otherwise, you can have the crash. Or with surgeons, going through it step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step correctly makes the difference between getting the right part amputated and the wrong part amputated, which sometimes does happen. So learning how to do things that are tedious step-by-step -step can be a useful skill. Painful to learn, but useful. Before pressing on, anything about this sample of combination or tedious things that needs more stuff. I think Netflix was considering that show, Tedious Things, but just the title just says why. Why not? So they went with Stranger Things, because that's, that's better. But you could have an interesting series called Tedious Things, which would be... <laughs> yeah, it would be kind of, yeah, just, just a whole episode of really tedious things. Nothing exciting happens. It's just all tedious. People doing truth tables and their taxes and stuff. In today's episode, the kids do their taxes. <laughs> and the Demogorgon. Demogorgon does his taxes, too. Like, ah, I'm a force of evil, but this is worse. I cannot handle this. Now we get to more table building. Speaking of tedious things. Now, when building a table, the objective or ultimate goal is, as I mentioned before, to test an argument for validity. So before we table build properly, we would need an argument. And of course, the argument will have premises, one or more. Everyone has just one conclusion. Now, when you're talking about the categorical logic, the nice thing about categorical logic, one of the many nice things is there's only one type of argument, the categorical syllogism. One, two premises, one conclusion. With true functional logic, you only have one conclusion. Arguments always have one conclusion, no more, no less. But with true functional logic, in theory, well, obviously not in practice, you could have infinite premises. So, could be any number of premises, and they could be any anything. So that's both good and bad. On the plus side, super flexible. As many premises as you need. The downside is the premises could be literally anything, and they are unlimited. But the test for validity involves this. You gotta get your argument. So for example, we'll take our old friend, affirming the antecedent, also known in Latin as uh, modus ponens. And we'd have premise one, if P then Q, premise two, P, conclusion Q. And the question would be, is this valid? We know it is, so I'm oh, sorry, spoiler alert, valid. But how do we show it? Well, what we gotta do is build the table. So how do we table build to test for validity? Well, our rule construction always works the same. So one thing that's handy about tables is rule building never changes. So it's always <coughs> two to the n, where n is the number of variables. In this case, we have three variables, so we know we've got four rows. Then we've got to know how many columns we have. As mentioned, the column calculation, unfortunately, we don't have like a handy formula like C equals, you know, you know uh, n to the two or something. It's this. Uh, and this will be not really a formula because it can change. The number of columns is always equal to 
the number of variables. That part's easy. Plus, and this is where it gets all mucky, uh, every premise and every conclusion gets its own, each one gets its own column, unless, of course, they're the premise or conclusion is already there as a variable. And then if the premise or conclusion is complicated, then it has to get broken down as well. And so unfortunately, there's, there's no handy like C equals, you know, N to the Z or something. It's just you've got to go with, you know, one column for each variable, one column for each premise, one for the conclusion, unless of course the premise and conclusion are also variables, in which case you don't double up. And if the premise or conclusion is complicated, you're going to break it down, then it can end up being you know, quite a few more. So even though there's a clear method to it, again, it's not like a, it's not as simple as this, where it's just you know, a really nice, simple formula. So in this case, again, the number of rows is easy. It's always two to the n, so four. Now, each variable gets its own column. Now, by convention, just like traffic laws, which you know, red means stop because said, hey, you know, let it stop. We put the variables on the far left, like over there with Bernie Sanders, and we do them in alphabetical order. Just, again, it's a matter of just tradition. Just like stop signs are red octagons because of tradition. Could they be blue triangles? Yeah, as long as we all knew they were blue triangles. Then comes the more complicated part. So each premise gets its own column. The conclusion also gets its own column. And then the guiding rule is no repeats. Because if you put it up there twice, it doesn't change anything. So premise one is P to the Q. So that goes up there. Premise two is P. It's already there. Would it be wrong to put it up again? Well, no, but it would be redundant. So if we put up P again, it just we'd just be doing it twice for no good reason. Likewise, the conclusion is Q, but it's already there. And if it's if it's the same, which it is, you'd just be wasting time just doing the same thing twice. And if it was filled in differently, then it would be wrong. So ne there's no doubling up. So then you put in the uh, T's and X's. So here's how you do it. Same as we've seen all, no changes. So you head to the right, and you put in TX, all good, until you run out of rows. In this case, we run out of four, so TF, TF. Then we head to the left, and we alternate doubles, pairs. And then we're done, because we get all the stuff in for our variables, and we don't have any more, more columns. Then, the next step is we got to put in the T's and F's for this. Now, conveniently, this is just like our sample table. So we know exactly how to do this because we've done it. So it's conditional. So conditional says, hi there, I'm a conditional. If my antecedent is true, my consequent is false, I'm false. Otherwise, I'm true. So if true, then true is true. If true, then false is false. If false, then true is true. And if false, then false is so, so far, nothing new. So then the question is, how do we know if it's valid or not? Well, here's how it's done. Validity, as you might recall, back in the ancient days and before time, is this. If all the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. So what we're doing is, in a way, is a test for invalidity. And relying on the exclusive or, because an argument is valid or invalid, but not both. So if you show that it's invalid, well, it's invalid. If you show it's not invalid, it's got to be valid. So how do we do that? Well, here's how we do it. We identify the columns, and we don't actually, you know, the, the, the marking of the columns is just a, a practical thing. You wouldn't actually do it as, you know, an essential part of the process. You just have to look at it. So, you don't have to like actually mark them. But as a practical matter, it can be handy. 
So this would be premise one, this would be premise two, and this would be our conclusion. And so if we see a single row, and we don't do it like you know, tic-tac-toe or connect four, we can't go at, at, at angles. If we see a single row where all the premises were true and the conclusion was false, then by definition it's invalid. Because invalid means all the premises could be true and the conclusion false. So premise one, premise two, conclusion. True premise, true premise, true conclusion. So that's okay. False premise, false conclusion, true premise. But this is also okay because even though the conclusion is false, one premise is. So that's okay. True premise, true conclusion, false premise, also okay. True premise, false premise, the conclusion is false, but again, this is okay because one of the premises is false, so this is okay. So we never find a single row where all the premises are true and the conclusion is false. So, now, which is good because this is modus ponens, and it would be really pretty weird if after hundreds of years it was suddenly shown to be invalid. Like, oops, we've been getting it wrong. So in our final minute, what would an invalid argument look like? Well, let's make a slight change and replace our good friend modus ponens with its nemesis, the anti-modus ponens, the affirming the construct. So uh, P then Q, Q therefore P. Now, interestingly enough, or boringly enough, our table itself remains unchanged. So if we build a table for this, you know, it's P, Q, P then Q, nothing changes. The only thing that actually changes is how we look at it. So this is still premise one, but, and this, and this was what makes all the difference in the world, this is premise two, and this is now our conclusion. So the table looks exactly the same, because it's got all the same parts, there's parts and parts, but we just look at different places. So um, premise one, true, premise two, true, conclusion, true. That's okay. False, false, true. That's okay. But here, true premise, true premise, ooh, false conclusion. So not okay. And so we show that it could be all true premises, false conclusion, so invalid. Which is good because this is our, you know, old nemesis affirming the antecedent, which has been established for centuries to be invalid. So it's good it turns out to be still invalid. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the stuff. Uh, before moving on to anything, I mean, before ending, uh, anything about anything that we Is there like sparks coming out of that or something? Probably tell the dean's office in case, in case it doesn't go wrong. Okay, see you on um, a Thursday, unless the room is condemned.